the one and only Mr. Daliso Chaponda! Uh, thank you so much, Wanda. How you doing? Excellent. Well, it's been a brilliant night. There's been a lot of performance. Can you give everybody who's been on a big round of applause? Awesome, 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 awesome. This is my first time in Rwanda. I'm having a ball of a time. Now I live in England and my agent was scared. My agent said, don't go to Rwanda. And I'll tell you what the problem is. People in England, they don't know anything about Africa other than what they've read in the newspapers. Like when I was going to do a show in, in Kenya, they said, don't go to Kenya. There's Boko Haram, they'll blow you up. I went to Kenya, nobody blew me up. Then I was going to South Africa, they said, don't go to South Africa. It's violent, they'll kill you. I went to South Africa, it wasn't violent, no one killed me. I was going to Nigeria, they told me, don't go to Nigeria. They're crooks, they'll rob you. I went to Nigeria, they're crooks, they robbed me. <laughs> but what I found amazing about Rwanda is you don't live up to a lot of the African stereotypes. Because I came here thinking I'm coming to an African country. And then I stepped out of the plane, I look around, the streets are clean. I was like, what the hell? I'm not in Africa, I'm in Wakanda, exactly. I was like, what the hell is this? And then I was getting a little bit tired of waiting in a queue and I wanted to bribe someone and they said, oh, you can't bribe people. You can't bribe people in Rwanda, you'll get in trouble. I was like, what? No corruption, but it's Africa. They said, no, no corruption. Then I came to this show, it started two hours late and I was like, ah, I'm in Africa. <laughs> I'm still in Africa. <laughs> oh, but I, I, I love, I've had a crazy year. I did Britain's Got Talent. For those of you who didn't watch it, I ended up coming third. And I'm very, yeah, I'm happy with third. Because the way I look at it, coming third, if it was the Olympic 100 meters, is like being the first white guy. It's very respectable. <laughs> and my parents, they flew over from Malawi to watch me in the competition. But what was funny is they were giving me African advice. There were things like, hey, you shouldn't eat any food backstage. The other contestants will try to poison you. <laughs> and the person who won was brilliant. He was a musician. His name was Tokyo Myers. He was brilliant, and he did something amazing. Do any of you know how much money you win if you win Britain's Got Talent? Quarter of a million pounds. Lot of money. He took that money and he gave it all to charity. Yeah! He gave it all to charity to help poor children. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful, it's inspiring, but I've got to tell you if I had one, uh uh, no, no. I, I would not, I would not. I mean, I'm not a monster. I would have given some of the money to help poor women, but that would have been one by one. personal arrangement basis. <laughs> uh, but what I'm also enjoying about being back in Africa is I don't have to live with the stupid questions. Because like, have any of you gone to America? America, they ask you stupid questions. Uh, one person approached me and said, hey, you're from Africa. Are there cars in Africa? I just said, no, we ride the elephant. We put the bag in the trunk, we say, go Dumbo. One guy asked me, are there post offices in Africa? I said, no, we write the letter, we put it on the arrow, we shoot it to the next village. <laughs> and people think I'm talking about white Americans. No, the craziest questions I got was from black Americans. Because then to them, Africa's the motherland, right? It's their roots. I was talking to one guy, Kylie, just watched Black Panther, they got too excited. And he came to say, yo, dog! You from the motherland? Can you give me an African name? Can you give me an African name, a good African name? I said, okay, your name is now Mazunzo. Good name, my brother's name. He said, no. No, dog, I want a real African name. I want a name with a click. I want some. 
I said, okay, your name is Ngong Ngong Ngong. Ngong. He said, that's some cool shit. What's it mean? I said, it means you're an idiot. That's what it means. <laughs> oh, but it's good, man. It's good. And Long John was just on. Long John was on Are you from Zimbabwe. Great guy. A lot of people don't know this. I did Britain's Got Talent, but first, I wanted to do Zimbabwe's Got Talent. Yeah, I wanted to do Zimbabwe's Got Talent until I found out no matter how many people voted, Robert Mugabe always won. <laughs> Uh, and they're having their elections. They're having their elections to mo on Monday, right? And it's all crazy. And what I don't understand is America has sent supervisors to make sure that the elections are fair. But I'm like, if you've elected Donald Trump, you can't send supervisors to supervise anybody else. How can you be telling us how to do it when you elected that idiot? I I mean, I don't understand. I honestly don't understand. How could America have gone from Barack Obama, right, who was intelligent, eloquent man, to go to Donald Trump? That's like if you found out that Jay-Z, huh? He's dumped Beyonce. And then tomorrow you see him walking down the street with Shadibu. Like, what the hell is going on? I don't understand. <laughs> oh. But it's hard to give away money if you grew up poor. Clap your hands if you grew up poor. Yeah. I remember Christmas time, the gifts were terrible. I once went to my dad and said, Dad, huh? why does Father Christmas go to the neighbors, gives them the big remote control car, comes here, gives me this little metal one. The wheels don't even move. My dad didn't want to ruin the matter. He told me, look, you have to understand, Father Christmas is a racist. <laughs> and my favorite thing to do, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, is I love to sit with these catalogs, where at the back of the catalog, it's got pictures of toys. And I'd circle the toys that I wanted. And I'd say to myself, one day, when I'm rich, I'll buy this toy for myself. I don't need you, Father Christmas, one day, when I'm rich. Now I'm older, I can afford the toys, but I don't want them. But I haven't changed so much. Now I look at women who are out of my league, and I'm like, one day, <laughs> when I'm rich. But you change how you look at relationships as you get older. I remember when I was in my 20s, if I was at a bar, and I saw a beautiful 20-year-old, with a fat 60-year-old, I'd be disgusted. I'd say, look at that gold digger! Gold digger! She take me money. <laughs> but as you get older, you realize you can't judge people. So now if I'm in a bar and I see a beautiful 20-year-old, I think to myself, I hope she's a gold digger. <laughs> it's my only chance. <laughs> but money does crazy things. Like, did you hear this? Usher, the singer Usher gave a woman herpes. And to apologize, he gave her one million dollars. For one million dollars, that sounds like a good deal. In fact, if you give me one million dollars, you can give me Ebola. I don't care. <laughs> At least I'll die rich. You know? <laughs> oh, it's crazy times, man. And I got my first hate mail, my first hate mail last year because of a joke I did on television in England, on Britain's Got Talent. What you've got to understand is the crowd was all white, right? They were all white, and I was black. I mean, I'm still black, but... <laughs> but I was black in front of all of these white people, so I said, hey, 200 years ago, this would have been an auction. Yeah, you are laughing. Some of them got very angry, like the angry racist guys started sending me messages on Facebook. They were saying, oh, if you don't like the slavery, go back to Africa, monkey man. And I was like, I don't think this guy knows how slavery worked. It was more import than export. But the angriest message I got... <laughs> The angriest message I got, I have to read to you, because I could not believe a person could be this angry at somebody they've seen on television once. 
Maybe someone who's broken your heart. But a person, he's seen me do jokes about slavery once he's angry, and he messages me. Fuck you and your motherfucking father! <laughs> Fuck you, asshole! No hello. He just started with the insults. But I don't want to lose a potential fan. And I figure maybe he's been watching too much rap music. He thinks you've got to talk to people by saying, what's up, mofo, yo, yo. So I just said, thank you very much. You should put that to music. You'd make a good rapper. Yeah. He didn't like this. He says, don't you ever be here. We'll fucking kill you, you bitch ass mother. You're a small mother. I'll fuck you like a dumb ass broke bitch. And I said, that does not rhyme at all. <laughs> uh, but you can't take people seriously. People get too angry on the internet, man. People get too angry. And I can't respect one of these internet trolls who write you abuse, because it's too easy. Huh? They don't like you, they're sitting in their room alone, they go, send. I could respect an internet troll like in the 16th century, because that took effort. They'd see you and be like, I don't like him. I'm going to get him. You'd have to get a pen. Then, oh, page boy, can you deliver this message? <laughs> I have a message for you, my liege. Fuck you and your motherfucking father. <laughs> but the insults are all stupid. The worst insults I've got are racial insults. I get them a lot when I go to America. I get them when I go to England. And I realize, though, that racists are lazy. They are. If you think about the racial slurs, it's always lazy. Like, nigger comes from negra. They're just describing black. That's what I see, black. All the words, they're just describing what they see. And I saw this happen live, because I was walking through the streets of Liverpool. And I was with a white woman, and there was this angry racist. He got angry. But he didn't have a word for a black person with a white one. So he just made one up. He went, penguin! <laughs> penguin! And I was like, penguins are cute! How is this an insult? But then I thought about it. I thought about it and I was like, there's so many other things he could have used which are black and white. He could have been newspapers! <laughs> old televisions! That song by Michael Jackson! Michael Jackson. <laughs> uh, and my father is a politician. This is why this guy messaged me, fuck you and your father. Because my father is a politician in Malawi, and I can finally talk about it. Because last year, my dad was being investigated for corruption. Yes, he was being, and, and last month, he was cleared of all charges. Yeah, oh, I was very happy, right? Because I was like, I was sure he was innocent like 80%, no? You know, have you ever had a family member accused? You're like, of course I believe you, but part of you is like, but what if he's not? <laughs> right, and he was cleared of all charges, and I'm so glad, because if he was guilty of being corrupt, the first thing I would have called him, and I said, hey, Dad, you're corrupt. Why didn't you give me any? Where's my cut? <laughs> but my daddy was the minister of education, and no matter what grades I got, they weren't good enough. If I got five A's, two B's, you'd say, no, you're not reaching your potential. Apply yourself. If I got seven A's, one B, you'd say, no, you're not reaching your potential. Apply yourself. But I understand he was a self-made man. He wanted me to be like him. But now, you know, I mess with him. I call him because Malawi is falling apart. I called him the other day and said, Dad, there are food shortages all over Malawi. People are on strike. Why aren't you reaching your potential? <laughs> Maybe you should apply yourself. <laughs> oh, and it's hard to find love this day and age, man. People in relationships, clap. Okay. Single people, clap. Wow, lots of single people. Lots of single people, man. But the world is built for couples, huh? Think about it, all the holidays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Valentine's Day. Why don't they have one lonely bastard's day? Where you just buy your own box of chocolate. 
<laughs> but everybody's insecure about their bodies. Men and women. Women in the bedroom telling you stuff like, turn off the lights, don't look at me. And as a man, you're thinking, I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> men worry too. Men worry all the time. And men can't talk about it. At least I've heard a woman say to a friend, I'm having a bad week, I feel bloated. And a friend said, no, you look lovely, it's all in your mind. This is not happening between men. I could not call a man and be like, hey, Jabulani, I feel like I'm retaining water. He would laugh in my face. And men worry because we've got to give the women the orgasms. You've got to do it. But it's very difficult. Because it's not just the bedroom. We've got to get you in the mood. We've got to turn you on. Turning women on is like a video game. It's like a video game because you can have a turned on in the club. You get in the taxi, say one wrong thing, you're back on level one. And you don't remember the combination. And this is why you try to be romantic. And it is impossible to be romantic enough. Because you cannot compete with the movies. I remember watching Love Actually. You've watched Love Actually. We're watching Love Actually. My girlfriend nudged me, pointed at the screen, and she said, isn't that nice? Isn't it great the way that he treats her? Why don't you ever treat me like that? It's a movie. It's a fantasy. Could I bring home a porn movie? Isn't that nice? Isn't it great the way that she treats him? Why don't you ever treat me like that? With two of your friends. <laughs> and what was big news in England? I don't know if you watch it here. Did you watch there was a royal wedding? Did you watch the royal wedding? The best thing about the entire day is there was an American preacher. Did you watch the American preacher? Oh my God, he was the best thing. He brought some soul to the affair. He was talking about what is love. Love can change the world. And you've got to understand that those British people did not know how to deal with it. Because have any of you been to a white church? Like we are used to churches where people are clapping and singing. The first time I went to a white church, I was like, don't these fuckers believe? I was like, you have got to get God's attention. They were just like, e no, me, no, it was boring. And then in African churches, I don't know if you have it in Rwanda, but in Malawi, we have got miracles going down. Miracles, you have to be careful. Someone could throw crutches in your face. I was once next to a woman who started speaking in tongues. I wasn't expecting it. I was sitting next to her. She got up. She went, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't know what she was saying. Now I moved here. I know it was Kenya, Rwanda. That's what she was speaking. <laughs> got a beautiful language. Yeah. But my family was so religious. My teenage years, I started acting up. Your parents would have called a psychiatrist. My dad called an exorcist. I don't know if any of you have ever been exercised. It's no fun. They strap you to the bed with ropes. They start pouring holy water in your mouth. I was coughing and sputtering. <coughs> My dad did not think this was enough. He believes you spare the rod, you spoil the child. There was a big wooden cross. He grabbed it, passed it to the priest and said, Beat him. Beat the devil out of him. The priest began to whack me. I was on the bed like, ah, ah. So understandably, when the priest said, Satan. I figured I better play along. I better pretend. Now I've watched the Exorcist movie. I cannot turn my head around 360, but I gave it a shot. I said, I said, yes. I am Lucifer. And he said, Satan, leave this boy. I'm living. Then I got a great idea. I pointed at my dad and said, I'm going into him. <laughs> this is good. Now I'm going to go, but I noticed, I noticed before earlier when I did the dirty jokes, you guys weren't sure. You guys, are you guys like really conservative in Rwanda? Okay, I'll do one. 
I'll see if you laugh. And if you, do, if you don't laugh, I'll leave. If not, I'll do the d dirtier one. This is a test. Because what's your favorite position? Like these two girls here. What's your favorite position here? What? Doggy style. No, you must be proud of your face. Right. No, because I thought the best position was 69. 69 is great. Little give, little take. But you can't tell because I'm on stage. I am a short man. 69 is tough when she's taller than you. I ended up there going. <laughs> I think you're fine. I think you're fine. I'll do the dirtier one. I think you're okay. You're okay. You're still okay. Huh? There are no children here. There are no children. <laughs> Where are the children? How old are you? Well, it's your fault to bring your child to this show. Also, that child is old enough to know the birds and the bees. It's okay. <laughs> I won't tell the jokes in front of seven-year-olds, but you, you're ruined already. It's okay. So this is the final joke I'll tell you, and it's the only reason I do dirty jokes is because I had a bad experience. It was New Year's Eve 2014. And I was with a woman who got a great idea. She said, you know what we should do to bring in the New Year? Instead of going to a party, why don't we just make love? As a man, I don't know how to say no to that. I was like, okay. I'm going to have sex, okay. I should have said no, because come December 31st, she said, you know what would make it even better for me? Just imagine, I had an orgasm at midnight with the fireworks. Midnight is one second, one second. I couldn't be early, I couldn't be late. We had to put the clock next to the bed. Had to keep looking at the clock, looking at her, looking at the clock, looking at her. And I thought I was doing a good job till the bastards in the next apartment started to shout, 10, 9, 8. I do not work well under pressure. I started pinching and poking. <laughs> They're going six, five. Then I remembered when women are having orgasms, you look a bit like you're getting electrocuted. No one warns you, you're doing your thing, and suddenly she goes, huh. <laughs> And like gibberish comes out. She's like, don't touch me. Just don't touch me. So I grabbed her finger, I stuck it in the sockets. I turned on the power. She started shaking. Her hair was standing on end, and I know I shouldn't have electrocuted her, but at least I turned her on. Thank you so much, Rwanda. It's been fabulous being in Kigali. See you again soon. Keep it going for Michael.